Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Call the Damn Leads, the show by sales professionals for sales professionals. I'm your host, Drew B. Wilson, with more than two decades in sales. I've been through it, seen it, heard about it. Now I'm bringing it to you, my favorite people on the planet, the sales community, because let's be honest, this is the greatest career there ever is. It doesn't matter what personality you have, what background you come from, you can make a life in sales. And today's guest, someone who is no stranger to that, I'm very, very excited to hear more of his story. He's my new friend, Mr. Rob Jardinelli. What's up, brother? Jerby, I am so glad to be here and I cannot wait to talk, you know, wait and talk and chat with your listeners. So this will be really fun. I am very excited as well. I know we got connected before today and uh, I, I really want to know, man, bring us your hot and heavy sales story. We got to jump <laughs> right into it. All right. So we've, I've got two. So one is more a traditional sales story and one is more a social sales story because, you know, anyone who's in nonprofits, if you have nonprofit development professionals as an audience, it'll relate with that too. So my craziest sales story was I was in Vegas. So no, no story ever, <laughs> ever ends well there. And this was, you know, probably... 12 years ago or so. And there was a bet that our like most senior salesperson, he was like an executive director, not quite a VP that was there, made with one of the sales reps and he lost. And the bet was, and it was like 42 degrees out because it was like January, the loser had to jump in the pool with their clothes on and not, not go in and get changed for the rest of the night. And mm. <laughs> the executive director lost, did a cannonball in the pool did not have a drop of alcohol all night. So he did that completely sober, got out of the pool and was a trooper and stayed, you know, another probably hour or 90 minutes or so. Mm. That's my sales conference story. My craziest sales story was I went to an auction once where they were auctioning off a fur coat and one of the patrons got up onto the stage and took the fur coat off of the model, put it on themselves, stole the microphone from the auctioneer and commandeered the auction. <laughs> Did they buy the fur coat at least? They wore it the rest of the night, kind of like if anyone's seen 16 Candles, I don't know how old or not old your audience is. It, it was kind of like that woman who cut the hair off of Car the back of Carolyn's head when her hair was in the back of the door. It was kind of like that. Very awkward, and yet you just <laughs> run with it because they're like, what do you do? And, you know, I think there's – this is why I love sales because, A, I've been to, I don't know, a couple hundred conferences at this point in my journey, and there's so many funny memes and conversations and stories we won't tell for the sake of the uh, parties involved, especially <laughs> the ones in Vegas, you crazy characters. That town is just – I mean, Vegas is Vegas, but sales professionals and entrepreneurs in particular, there's one meme that I share where it's like day two at every entrepreneurial event, and it's a guy outside in the garbage can with his head just buried. Because <laughs> like, you guys, you get out of your comfort zone, you get away from family, friends, and you go crazy. But what I loved about your story is that it was the executive director, he lost the bet, owned up to it, didn't even need the alcohol, said, you know what? A bet's a bet. I'm a paying man. And I bet that guy has gone on to close tons and tons of business just because he honors his word. And absolutely. that's something I think is so powerful. Absolutely. And I think he's even sold a company since I'm not in touch with him anymore, but, you know, other than, you know, through the online stuff. And I believe he's, you know, been an executive, sold a company and is on to his next one. So he was quite an effective sales guy for sure. And so I'd love to know, Rob, tell me more about like kind of how did you get into sales to begin with? I mean, I know you said you've got, you know, several decades of experience, but like what was it that got you into sales to start? So what got me into sales to start was I actually began my career in the tech industry in the year 2000. So it was a completely different world than it is today. <laughs> and I was, and I'm more of an introvert and I was, I was a brand manager. So basically like I was like a merchandise manager. So I had a series of product lines in the networking space and the wireless space. And I managed the vendor relationships with those. And the folks that called, and I work for a technology distributor. It's now called TD Cynics. It used to be called Tech Data. I did that for about five years and one of the manufacturers, and I was living in Florida at the time, and one of the manufacturers I was working for had an opening in Austin. So I wound up taking that job and, and moving out to Austin and starting doing kind of more of an, a true outside sales role as opposed to before where I was in, an internal employee 
I was there every day. I did the business plans. I managed P like PL. So I understood all the basics of business. So it was really an excellent training ground for me to be a salesperson. And what's interesting about that type of sales, indirect sales is very different from direct sales because indirect sales requires, I don't want to say it requires more business acumen, but I think it definitely requires a little bit more organization and patience just mm. because you're not necessarily in control of all the sales because you're selling to people who are selling to the end customer. So you don't really have as direct of a stake in that insofar as you can only do so much influencing. Whereas if you're the actual person calling on the account, you know, you have a, a lot higher level of influence, you know, when you have, when you have that luxury and that, that good fortune. And what I love about what you kind of mentioned is how you went from, you know, internal employee to being a sales professional. And there's so much nuance to how that can transition. And what I loved was, you came in from the service perspective, like, hey, I'm, I'm here to service and help and do these things, and then made that transition into sales. And I'm a believer that if you can do well in service, you can do phenomenal in sales because there, it's just the way that you build relationships and the way that you lean in and you just operate a little bit differently because you care about customers and if you've ever been yelled at by them enough times from a service <laughs> standpoint, like you realize you don't want to be in that position again. So Rob, what would you say, you know, over the years, you've kind of made your sales superpower. What's that thing that you do that you think is kind of different than everybody else? I think people have the misconception that all salespeople are raving extroverts and they're all the life of the party and they, you know, backslap and glad handle everybody. And that's not true. I would say, you know, 70% of the exec like CEOs are introverts. So a lot of people mm -hmm. who get to really successful places are more introverted. So I think my superpower is, is that I listen and extroverts can listen. And it's, you know, it's one of those things, especially if you've got anyone who's more of an, an executive role that's listening right now. Don't automatically send your extrovert to that conference because it depends on the type of conference it is. If it's about glad handling, yes, send your extrovert. But if you want to gain competitive insight and competitive knowledge and what your competitors are doing and get a leg up on some other people, you may want to send an introvert because they're not going to command the room and crave the attention. And the one thing that I have learned is one, people, two things. One, people love to talk about themselves. That, that's first and foremost. And when you look at them and you ask questions and you listen, it never ceases to amaze me how much people will open up to you, whether they've known you for five years or five minutes. It, it just, mm. it, it, you know, and I'm in a different life now. I still do, you know, a level of sales, but in the social events and the nonprofit events I go to, it's amazing how pretty high stature people will share stuff with like little old me who's, you know, walking around the room. It's, it's really fascinating what people will share if they're comfortable with you. Well, and I'm going to share a, a book that you've probably read it and it might even be on your shelf behind you there because you've got some pretty <laughs> great titles. I, I can, can't see them too well, but I know you've got some good ones up there. But The Introvert's Edge. Yes. Have you ever read that? I've heard of it. I read like the foreword of it, but I didn't like read it, read it. I would recommend if you like to read, grab it. And anyone who's listening, if you feel as though you've ever tended to be a little more introverted or reserved, there's some power to that. Understand that that silence is powerful and the ability to be an empath and to listen, it puts you in a different atmosphere of ability when it comes to sales and service. And I also like, I think it's important when I try to send people to events or when I go to events, I'm a little more introverted myself. I can play the extrovert. Don't get me wrong. I've, I've learned to develop that skill set, but at heart, I'm an introvert. I like to do me. I'm kind of a behind the scenes guy. I always try to pair up with an extrovert though, because you can, like, if you can find someone that you're close with that knows your style and your vibe, they'll go out and do all the glad handing and they're going to be the one that's like, oh, I'm just here to shake hands and kiss babies. You got to talk to Druby. Like, that's the guy with the answers. And it, there's a power play that you can use there. So I like to share that because that's something that I've used effectively is like pairing up with more of an extroverted person and letting them kind of play that part and then sitting back and being the more reserved person. And so, Rob, I would love to know, you know, as you transition out of the sales stuff and kind of more into like the nonprofit side and what you're doing now, how did that happen? So um, my now husband runs a luxury lifestyle magazine for the state of Texas. So he 
not only do we go to events in Austin all the time, but also events in San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, which, you know, we, we initially connected because you lived in Texas for a period of time. Yeah. So I was, I had been in sales about a decade at that point. And this was before the infamous pool incident. So, um, so <laughs> it was one of those things when I came home and said it, I, I for once had the shocking story. So what I realized though, cause for about five years and I did national, regional and global roles. So I would be traveling to God knows where all week, every week. And then I'd come home, I have to throw on a suit, throw on a tux, throw on a whatever and go to an event or go to a gala. And the longer I did it, because there's something, when you're going to an event that raises a million dollars, there's a lot of really effective sales techniques that you see. There's a lot of really effective relationship building techniques that you see. Mm. You see the power of emotion and any, I don't care how technical or data driven your product is, there is always going to be a level of emotion in anything that you, you know, that you purchase or buy. But the more of it I was doing, going to those, when I had to go to a business meal, when I was in the tech industry, it got increasingly painful, like to the point where the last year, if I was in New York for meetings for the day and I knew that there was a dinner after the fact, I purposely stay in Philadelphia or Boston. So I wouldn't have to go because when you walk into a room and everyone kind of the one, they're on the same page and you can tell when, you know, when organizations on the same page, there's just a lot of power in that. And a lot of people, and I think most people, most salespeople can relate they'll get invited to a business meal or they'll go to a conference and they have no idea why they're there. They have no idea what their objectives are. They have no idea what their goals are. It just creates this really boring time. And yes, you may get a really nice fancy meal, but there's more to life than a nice fancy meal. You know, there's people in your life that you care about that you'd probably rather spend your time with. And there's only so many times that you can do those nice hundred dollar steaks before it really kind of gets, you know, gets a little boring. So the longer I did that, the just the more painful it became. And then after about five years of doing that's when I transitioned out of tech sales and navigated into this world full time and really made going to events kind of my career and my passion. And I've gone to over 2000 now in the last 15 years. I appreciate you sharing that because I, I find that when I'm working with professionals, you know, there's kind of phases that you go through. You start as an employee. You're like, all right, cool. I'm going to go and work and I'm going to sell stuff for someone else. And I only got to show up and do what I do. And I get paid to sing and dance and whatever. And then you might transition up to like a leadership role or, or kind of stepping into being that entrepreneur and, and you progress through the process. And you're right. At a certain point, the, the $300 steak dinners that you could have went and spent 50 bucks on at your local favorite place where the atmosphere is better and you don't listen to people bragging about how great they are and all the <laughs> things that they've done. And like, don't get me wrong. There's a time and a place for that. I Absolutely. understand there's nuance, but what I love about that transition is there's a lot of people right now that are in that spot. Yes. They're miserable where they are, even though they're making, you know, a hundred, 200, couple hundred thousand dollars a year, they've got the benefits or whatever that comfort it's strangling them. And it's actually preventing them from stepping into the thing that they're truly going to be the greatest at. And I can see that in you. I can see where you've been like that passion for what you do now is so much different. And what I love about it is that raising money is not easy. You ever call no. and ask somebody to donate 20, 30, 50 thousand dollars or to sponsor an event? It is a hundred percent different kind of sales than calling to sell someone a product or service that they actually want. Because you can only tell somebody that it's a tax write-off so many times. Yeah, they know it's a tax write-off. That's why they're making big donations. <laughs> but what's the emotional connection? What's the relationship there? What is the value to them being a part of this movement? And Rob, I'd love to know how you kind of use that transition and, and maybe can offer some some advice for someone who's trying to go through that. Like, I want to get out of the thing I'm stuck in and, and go all in on the thing that I want to be doing. One, you have to acknowledge, like you said, you have to acknowledge that it's scary because you're mm. giving up something that's comfortable. You're kind of giving up. I don't want to say something that people envy, but a lot of people don't have. People are always envious of what they don't have. So for a lot of people, the grass is always greener on the other side. So there's there's that level that level of envy there. So just acknowledge that it's going to be scary as you transition out of it. Second, for me, what I realize, and you know, I've transitioned to now where I'm, you know, doing consulting and coaching, is what makes you uniquely you. I know that there is not anyone who did sales for 15 years and then goes and writes about nonprofit events. I, I don't really have people that I can pick up the phone and be like, hey. 
how did you navigate this transition? You know, I hope someone else <laughs> calls me someday asking <laughs> for that advice because I'd be really glad to give it. Find what's uniquely you. When you find what's uniquely you, more opportunities are going to open themselves up. But you have to be brave enough and you have to be courageous enough to be like, okay, I have this one thing that nobody else has. And when you have something nobody else has, that's scary too, because you don't know how the market's going to react to it. You may wonder, am I five years ahead of my time? The more that you do it, the more doors are going to get knocked down. And that's always, you know, with me is the more I do it, the more I explain and people are like, you know what? That's absolutely the case. I'm sick and tired of going to X, Y, or Z. And one of the reasons I started this was coming right out of COVID. I mean, I can't tell you how many executives told me. I literally have one tell me that they would pay to not go to stuff <laughs> if they could. And I, I was like, fun. okay, it, is it really that bad now? Because, you know, I haven't gone to a tech business dinner in nine or 10 years now, but it is. So, you know, you, you want to make, you want to make sure that you just embrace your, you know, what makes you uniquely you. And don't be afraid of it. Be unapologetic about it. Know that what you're going to do is probably going to alienate some other people. And that's perfectly okay. What I have learned about events and, you know, having gone to a lot of them is for everyone I'm invited to, there's probably 10 I'm not invited to, but I'm not going to get jealous because I've got plenty of things that I can go to. So don't be jealous of what you don't have. Focus on the incoming of what you do have, because there's actually a lot of opportunity coming to you if you show up. And, comma and you act like you want to be there and and those are really the two things of of wherever you show up whether it's a sales call or a social event you have to act like you want to be there that's powerful i forget what the the phrase is i always butcher i've been butchering quotes all day today rob so forget <laughs> it, but I, it's like emotion creates motion right and so if you go to an event with a sour attitude i promise you everybody there that's trying to connect with people is going to look at you and go I'm not in the mood for sour grapes today. I'm going to move on to the next person. I would love your perspective, you know, because you have such an amount and an immense value to knowledge of events and, and being successful in them. And, and you know, I know you have a, a consulting practice that you probably coach some of this stuff on. But like if you could give the, the listener maybe one or two really powerful things that they should focus on at every event that they go to, what would you say those might be? Set goals, do research. Set goals, do research. Can you expand on that a little bit? So when you set goals, I always say that goals need to, there's three types of goals. There is confidence goals, there are purpose goals, and there are joy goals. And whether it's business or personal, I've never known a successful salesperson who didn't in some way bring some personal in. So you need all three of those things. So if you're going to an office Christmas party and they have, so I'll give you a good example. When I, when I was in the tech industry, I managed a company called Nortel Networks, and they were a big dominant networking player until like the late 2000s, and they went under. But every year we did these cookie tins that were chocolate-covered Oreos, and people would go crazy for them when we would have them at an event. So if you arrived early and on time, you would get one of those cookies. If you showed up late and you weren't paying attention, that can be a goal. That goal is going to make you really happy because you're going to get to have this wonderful, you know, this wonderful thing to eat. So it's not just about business. So I always, the people I work with, I always advise in the beginning, do three goals and do one in each lane because you want to create a level of happiness for being there and something to genuinely look forward to, especially if events are painful. That's a way to find something that you can look forward to. If you got, you know, an invitation that said that the signature cocktail is going to be your favorite whiskey, get there on time so you can get that signature cocktail so that you have it in hand and that will make you feel more comfortable. So joy is really, you know, joy is any one of those things. Confidence is doing something that's outside of what you would normally do or something you haven't done before or something you've failed at before. And then purpose is getting a contact getting information, getting those things so that you can come out of come out of that event thinking that it was worthwhile for you to attend. So those are really kind of the three, you know, the three lanes that you would want to you would want to do and work with where that's concerned. Those are great. And I don't know if you notice, I've been taking notes over here, Rob, because I'm a continual student, <laughs> right? I love to learn every single day. I'm like, I'm going to take a little of this. I'm going to take a little of this. Ooh, that's good. I like that. And so 
it's no surprise to me that with all your experience and all the knowledge that you've poured into us today that you got into consulting and helping others on this path. So would you mind telling us a little bit about like specifically who you work with, kind of how you help get them dialed in? So I work with really all client facing professionals. And the reason for that is, you know, because I know that a lot of consultants, they'll do a really specific niche. With sure. what I do, the problem is, is that if I only worked with one type of person, I wouldn't be paying attention to all the different dynamics that are out there. Because the thing is with mm. events, you're dealing with human beings. So you may be a salesperson and you may be because someone got sick. And I think all of us have been sent to something at the last minute where they got sick and it's a marketing conference. And let, let's say you get stuck in a marketing, marketing analyst meeting, which may be a bunch of extro, introverts and you're an extrovert. You want to make sure that you're around as wide a range of people as possible. So really what I do with client facing professionals is we work on various conversation topics, things that they feel most comfortable with, and we lean into those things so that they feel comfortable talking to anybody. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. what I do on an individual level. And really, I would say it's from mid career, you know, to executive that I work with. And then I work with organizations because they want to optimize their teams better. They're tired of hosting bad business meals. They're tired of conferences, feeling like they're a waste of time, they're a waste of money, they're a waste of resources. Because, you know, companies put a lot of resources. When they go to a conference, like if you're in the tech industry and go to CES, I mean, you're spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars there, that you want to really make sure that you're optimizing those events and you're treating everyone on your team with the unique special gifts that they have. Because th the thing is, and I'm a believer, treat everyone with kindness, treat everyone with dignity. But how you go about that, people are going to respond to different things. And mm. as the good organizations and the ones I work with know, I want to send certain types of individuals to certain types of events because it's going to give ROI and it's going to allow that employee to grow. And when you can do those two things, you wind up with a better company culture and you wind up with more, more morale because everyone's seen as having different skill sets and not the traditional, oh, they get to go to this event all the time that's really cool because they're the most boisterous person on the team. The really good organizations realize that there's a place for that, but there's a place for other people at the table too. Yeah, that's so true. And and what I really think is so interesting, having been on both sides, right? I've gone to hundreds of events the last few years. We've also, I was a part of a company that hosted hundreds of events. And what I will tell you with 100% certainty is whether you are a guest or the host of an event, there are systems, there are processes, there are things that you can follow to make it a little bit easier on yourself. I promise event day will always test you, <laughs> whether you're a, a guest or a host, there will be a million different things that come up and, and throw you for a loop. But I know working with professionals, having some folks in your corner that have gone down that path, who have done those things, it'll save you a ton of money. Because I've watched people walk in and sign checks for $100,000 for AV equipment, not realizing they spent $10,000 for an AV router to get Wi-Fi that didn't work all day. You know, And, and I've been there where people have paid $5,000 to be a backstage member and realize that the backstage is actually in front of the door to the backstage <laughs> uh, where they get to see people walking by with their security. You know, so... Working with a professional, Rob, I know this is where you can really dive in and, and help people, whether they're they're the guest or the host and, and setting things up for success. So what's the best way for someone to come and find you and learn more about what you guys do? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. And I do want to say one thing before that. And that is, is that I have separate host and guest curriculums just because what's expected of either. And I'm glad you brought that up are very, yeah. very different things. And I would say 75% of the people I work with, they go through the guests first. I kind of make them unless... If you've come and you've chaired a million dollar event, I know that you, we may be able to bypass that. So, you know, yeah. I wanted to make sure to highlight that, but people can find me at eventmindset.com. They can download a free cheat sheet there. It's called six ways to gracefully exit any conversation. So there's ways to do that nicely and politely. It, it's more of a high level one. It's people that I work with more specifically and more closely will get into more tactical things about exchanging information and, and all that. But it's really just about exiting a conversation when you feel that it's run its course so that mm. you know that when you're at something, don't find that one person, find lots of people. You don't need to grab onto one person as a crutch. That's how you build confidence and how, you know, me as an introvert, I know now I want to talk to 10 people if, I have, if I'm at a cocktail reception for an hour. I don't want to talk to one. 
And that's, you know, a, a really important thing with Grove. And with that comes more opportunity because you're going to talk to 10 times the number of people that can come with that 10 times the number of leads. Well, and you know what? I, I will agree that I think the ability to exit a conversation gracefully is important on both sides, right? You should be a great totally. guest and you should know how to exit a conversation, like reading body language and seeing this person's trying to move on and you don't want to be rude. Like there's so much nuance to that. And as a host, wanting to talk to as many people as possible without them feeling brushed off or, or thinking that you're a jerk because you only said hi to them, but they don't understand that event day is crazy. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of nuance to that. So I think a cheat sheet on how to exit a conversation is fantastic. I, for one, will be going to grab it. Remind me where I can check that out. Eventmindset.com. Eventmindset.com. Rob, thank you so much for being here with us, man. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to chat with you, getting to learn more about what you guys do. And again, I know I'm going to be headed over to, uh, to check you guys out there. I appreciate it, Drewby. This was a lot of fun. You got it. Well, hey, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure you go follow Rob. Check out eventmindset.com. Get that download because it's going to be a good one, I'm sure. And uh, subscribe. Share the show. Tell a friend about it, right? If you got some value today, make sure someone else you know gets to enjoy and appreciate it as much as I did. And uh, more than anything, if you have a crazy sales story, you want to share it on the show, Call the damn leads.com forward slash podcast. Send us your info. I'd love to share it. Just like my friend Rob today, there's so many amazing things that we can learn through the stories of others and through the amazing things that sales can bring us. So make sure you guys go call the damn leads. We'll see you on the next one.